better for me to, to give this uh, pulpit up to a brother, Pastor Nelson Diaz.
So we was able to, you know, talk to her for a little bit and come and join in the conversation. And hopefully next week she'll be here. You know what I mean? So that's Praise the power God. of that book. That is the power of having the Bible. And I'm not saying now, you know, walk around every day with your Bible, but I'm just saying, if I would've been on my phone, you know I mean, just walking regular, this lady would not even talk to me. There's a power, there's power in the Word of God. There's so chapter three, Esther, we get right into it now, we have the whole team in. I'm gonna pray real quick. Father, I thank you for the opportunity. God, thank you, Spirit of God, just use me like you always do. The way you gave me this message, Father, that it touches the hearts and minds of our young ones and everybody here today. Speak through my words, Father God. It is you, it is thank not me. Lord. I am nothing without you, my God. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So I'm going to read 1 through 6. Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And the word of the living God reads this way. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of wow, Hamadita the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor, higher than all of the other none, other the other noblesse, no, no, noble, I'm sorry. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. I'll repeat that again. Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, <clears throat> why do you disobey this king, the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it, about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. For well, he had told him he was a Jew. Oh, but when Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of King Xerxes. Amen? It's the Lord. Now you might say, what does that got to do with my purpose? We'll get there. Just follow me through this whole thing. We got a few characters in this story. So we got Mordecai, we got Haman, and the book of Esther. This book is about Queen Esther. Chapters before she became queen. And Mordecai is her cousin. We talked to you about a little bit about Mordecai. Mordecai, a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. He lived in Susa, the capital of Persia. His great grandfather was Kish. He had been captive by Nebuchadnezzar. He acted as father to Esther, and he was a you know, cousin of her. So Esther's parents had died, and Mordecai raised her. Esther in chapter 2 was a crowned queen. And Mordecai told her, Look, don't, tell, don't reveal your identity. Don't tell them that you're a Jew. Right? Jews were treated differently, they probably, you know what I mean? They probably would have looked down on her. Amen? Well, we get to this place here where God with my man Haman. And the first point I want to make, oh, I looked at Mordecai's name. No, 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 no significant. That's probably because he had a Babylonian name. And just like Dave spoke last week, the enemy takes away your identity. And it says that his great-grandfather was pulled from, you know, with Nebuchadnezzar. So that means Daniel and all of them, his great-grandfather was in a mix of all that. The first thing they did is change their names. So he probably didn't have the Jewish name. Mordecai is probably a Babylonian name. So I want to tell you something as, as we read. I want to tell you, chosen, that the world will pay attention to you once you're different than them. Yes. Because we just read that Mordecai would have kneeled down to Haman, but it wasn't until everybody else started noticing that he wasn't kneeling down that they brought it up to his attention. See, it was fine for him, to, you know, he was doing, he wasn't doing it, that's it. But it was those around him that singled him out. 
So understand that then on, on this walk, you might have people that single you out. And sometimes, many times, those closest to you are the ones that are gonna turn on you. Because these are the people that Mordecai worked with. But he didn't kneel down, so they were like, yo, why you're not following the instructions? And I'm gonna tell you today that God is not about, God is not a God of politics. God is a God of obedience. Glory. Amen? Yes, he Amen. is. So tense. Mm -hmm. See, Mordecai was not given in. But I, I, before I get to that, I want to remind you again that those closest to you might be the ones that turn against you. When you start this walk with Christ, yep. those closest to you will turn against you. Not all the time, but most of the time. Especially if they don't know nothing about God. See, because you're going to switch things around. Amen? Amen. Lord. I'm not going to get too deep into that. Another thing is, oh, I can't, I can't skip this. Why do I say those closest to you might turn around you? Might turn on you? Look, there's no, um, how would I say the word, uh, you shouldn't, you, know, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't feel some type of way because of that. And I mean, yes, it's loved ones. But remember Jesus and Matthew. One day he was being praised, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then a few days later they were saying what? Crucify him, crucify him. So those people around you, those people closest to you, might just turn on you just like they did Jesus. So don't feel surprised. It's all part of the game. It's all part of life. People are going to turn on you. You imagine walking up to Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then all of a sudden, it's crucified. We want Barnabas, the murderer. Of the, that's what Jesus went through. So if you went through all that, what you're going to go through is, to be honest. Another point I want to make is that your decision will carry consequences. And I know I speak about this a lot because it's deep. It's marked and embedded in my heart. Our decisions have consequences, whether for good or for bad. You know why the Bible says Haman the Agagite? If you study your Bible, the Agagites were enemies of the Jews. And King Saul was supposed to destroy them all. And King Saul decided not to. For whatever reason, he disobeyed God. And 600 years later, this comes about. So his decision not to follow God's command now is here as a threat. Because as soon as Haman knew who he was, who Mordecai was, what he represented, now he want to, you know, just take care of all of them. And he, if you read the story, he paid. He, he wants to pay for everyone that he kills. He offers the king money just to get rid of the Jews. Your decisions have consequences. Yeah. I told you many times. I grew up in church. My mom got, got a little mad at God for whatever reason. She left the church. That brought a lot of consequences in our lives. Us as parents is different. Adults. Right? You guys are younger. You're, you make a mistake, you're going to have to pay the consequence. But sometimes those consequences can lead to affecting others around you. That, that, that decision that my mom took affected me and my brother. Any decision that I have made has affected my family. If you, and I say all the time, you have the choice to make any decision you want, but you don't have that same choice to choose the consequences. Amen? Oh, I'm gonna stay quiet. Don't be scared. Amen? Every decision has a consequence. So if God, commands you, God has been telling you, God has been talking to you about something. And listen. Amen? Praise you to God. Amen. Now let's get to the kneeling part. Do not kneel to the world. Right? God does, like I said, God doesn't do politics. He does obedience. And Mordecai was just being obedient to God. See, because kneeling meant honoring, and he only honored God. And a 
around this world, you know, we, we, there's been a lot of laws in place and a lot of things happening right now that we can't just be a part of. We have to stand as Christians for these things that are happening. Kneeling down is a sign of submission. And we cannot submit to these ideas. Amen? That's right. You follow me. Paul writes in Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the evil of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Peter writes, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you have when you live in ignorance. As the day just spoke about a battle, we walk around with a battle. We have the battle of the world, the people against the world against us, plus our own evil desires are against us. And we walk around like that. The world's bombarding us, and our evil desires is bombarding us. What a battle do we have? I found this translation, uh, I'm, not, I'm not even going to repeat the Bible just in case it's not, but I just like what it says. It says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into his own mold. To squeeze you into his own mold. That's what the world is doing. That's what the enemy has planned for it. All these things that he has put, it's just to get you away from your purpose. He already has set all these things up. See, people think of the devil, he's just, you know, all out and about just trying to destroy us. But now he already put all this thing in purpose or on, on, on a movement already. We're just guinea pigs. We just jump on it. Right? Like I said before, this is a gift and a curse. I can do so many wonderful things, but I can also lose everything. I can lose my salvation on a swipe. <laughs> wow. Praise See, the God. enemy planted all these things a long time ago. So we should not kneel to the world. We should not be conformed and in shape to the world. Let this shape you. Let this squeeze you into its more. Let God break you and build you back up through the word of God. Yes, praise God. Wow. Praise God. We should not allow ourselves to be pressed into the following. Corrupt customs, ungodly principles, or evil plans of action promoted by this world. You see it all over. I don't have to get into all that. Psalms 1 one, one through four says, Blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is on the law of the Lord and who meditates on the law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by a stream of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, it prospers. Yes. Not so the wicked. They are like shaft that the wind blows away. Shaft, una pajita. Gone. So if I am planted, I am rooted on the law, on the word of God. Anything they throw against me wouldn't move me, wouldn't shake me. I don't walk around with the sinners. Now I'm not saying you can't be friends with sinners. It's just to be around them and doing things that they do. Right? Because we got we got many sinners. We got friends that are sinners. We got family members. Right? Don't sit at the table with mockers. Those that mock God. It's not acceptable that you be in the mix of those conversations. Amen? Thank you, Lord. First Peter says one, uh, first Peter 1 15 and 16. But just as who called you is holy. So be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. God is a holy God, and he is looking for you to be holy. Amen? Amen. So work to work it every day. Like Pastor Dave said, oh, like last week was so beautiful. There's so many things that we got to get rid of. There's so many things that we have to do. Take it day by day. Day by day to get closer to God. I remember I couldn't leave the music. I left that. Right? Because I worked on it day by day. Day by day. But you have to work on it. If you don't work on it, if you don't care, if you're just on your headphones, gone, then it is what it is. But if you want to be holy, if you want to work towards that, if you want to get closer to God, work on that. Yes, yes. Work on it. Work on it. And 
be like Mordecai. Bro, I'm just not going to do it. I'm just going to, whatever the consequence is. Now, understand this, that now Haman goes to the king and puts a bounty on these people. And I didn't want to read all this story. This story is beautiful. I, I would encourage you to read it when you get home or when you get time. Even in the mix of everything, when they do, when they write it out, they do that like a lot, a lot that's like dice. And the number came out 12, so they, they got a whole year. See, even God would just put his hands on that. It wasn't a month later, it wasn't two months later, it was 12 months later when all this was going to happen. And they were going to kill them all. Right? It was a plan hatched style. Just because Mordecai did not nail down. Just because Saul did not take care of those uh, uh, Amal um, Amalekites back then, 600 years before. The world is so against us. And you have to see it. If you're blind to it, I will say, work on that. Because you have to see what the enemy is trying to attack you with. I mean, I, I, me and Dave spoke, and look, this generation got it harder than all of us. Like he said last week, for him to go do his thing, he had to sneak. Now there's no more sneaking. I can just open this thing up and just get lost and do whatever I gotta do. I mean, you guys got it harder. The information is like this. Everything is at, at your hands. I work on it. Understand that all these are the works of the, of the world, and we should not kneel to the world. Amen? That's right. Also, take control of your thoughts. Because, man, I'll tell you, man, sometimes the mind plays games with you. In 2 Timothy 4, uh, verse 5, Paul exhorts Timothy to be sober. Oh, whoa, whoa. I jumped pretty hard. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey God. Look, one of the hardest things for me, and, I, and I'm thinking me personally, is those thoughts that come of the things that I used to do. Because I've done so much. I'm way older than you guys. I did so many things. I get bombarded with these thoughts, and sometimes, yo, know, like my mouth gets watery. And I'm like, man, I gotta, I hear that in the instant, God, take it away. But that's not me anymore. But that smell, you smell something, or you just, you know, a thought, uh, uh, Something just pops up and you go back to that. You have to take your thoughts captive, scripture says. Anything you have doubt, bring it to the scriptures. Oh, beautiful. Yes. Use the word of God. Use this as a filter. Anything that you have doubt with. Look, the Bible doesn't speak about drugs, right? And I haven't seen cocaine in the Bible. <laughs> we um, none of that. Uh, alcohol, it speaks about alcohol, right? None of that is in the Bible. So how can I put it through the filter of the Bible? That's why I go to Timothy and it says, Paul exhorts Timothy to be sober-minded. Sober-minded literally means free from intoxicating influences. We speak of a person who is not drunk with alcohol or high on drugs as being sober. His or, her, or his mind is not under the control of a dangerous outside force. The Bible doesn't speak about drugs. The Bible doesn't speak about getting high. But he just told Timothy to be sober-minded. Mm -hmm. That I can't let another force enter me yes. and then take control of my decisions. Yes. You know how many bad decisions I made when I was drunk? You know how many bad decisions I made smoking weed? I'll tell you a funny one. Me and my wife was making a flying one day. Weed? No? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, were, we, were, we were smoking though. And when she made the caramel, who knows how to make caramel? What is it? Just sugar. And she pulled that caramel out. I was high out of my mind that I put my finger on it because it looked so delicious. And I think I had a third degree burn in my finger. I think it stuck to my finger. I was not in control. Uh, it's a funny story, but I was not in control. I was so high that I put my finger on that camera and it burned, bro. <laughs> uh, and it's funny now. But there was something else controlling me. Because if I would have been sober-minded, 
I would have known not to touch the hot car. I would have waited for that flan to, you know what I mean, do its thing. Amen? And I'm going to be honest, now that weed is legal, I struggle. Not that I struggle, that I, you know what I mean, but you smell it everywhere now. And I go back to those days, you know what I mean, of smoking and eating all the munchies and all that stuff. It's a battle. I have to take those thoughts captive. How many times I want to roll up and smoke? Now it's easier. Now you get a little, a little gummy or something, and you just, you know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. <laughs> so it's such easier for me back then if it would have been like that. You know what I mean? You just bite on it and then whatever. But I'm just saying, these are the thoughts that I have to fight. These are the thoughts that come into my head. And for those that know that what I'm talking about, I see a lot of faces. These are the thoughts you got to fight. See, but I got to be sober-minded. All right. I'm not going to lose my salvation on a high. Mm -hmm. Just for that 15, 20 minute buzz. I heard now it's, it's way longer than that. And I want to. And you're the friend of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So look, let's not kneel down to the world. Yes. And I'm giving you all of this up front because I want to talk about your purpose. Let's not kneel down to the world. Let's be like Mordecai. I will not kneel down. Come on. Right? When you're a Christian, oh, everybody here is a Christian? Is someone here not safe? Everybody here is a raise their hand and not safe? Everybody here is a Christian? Everybody, everyone here in this room is a son of God? Then you should not kneel down to the world. You should take your thoughts captive. Come on. And remember that your decisions have consequences. Everything that you do, bring it to the Word of God. If you have doubt, bring it to the Word of God. Now I want to talk about your purpose. I want you to step into your purpose. And in that, we see in chapter 4. And I'll tell you, man, read this, read this book. Short, ten, ch 10 chapters, I believe. Read it. Go to chapter 4, verse 14. For a time as this, for you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish, and who know and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. This is what I want to name the, the, the message today. For a time as this, but everybody that preaches on this preaches with the same title. For a time as this. What am I saying? If you read the story, Esther was queen. She was chosen to be queen. And now that this law has passed, that they're going to kill all the Jews, Mordecai goes to Esther and says, Esther, we need your help. We need you to talk to the king. That's your husband. And Esther tells him, uh, bro, you're on your own. I haven't spoken to him like in 30 days. And there's a law that you can't just go step to the king. The king has to call you. Esther said, look, I can't do it. He hasn't even called me in 30 days. And this is what Mordecai replies to her. Oh, what do you think? You're safe? Mm. Are you safe? Oh, because now you're the queen? Now you got all this, this goody goody stuff? You're safe? The help will come from somewhere else and you will also perish. Wow. And like he said at the end man. But you have come to your royal position for you for such a time as this. This was Esther's time to step up and do something for the kingdom of God. Yes. See, Ray, that's what it's all about. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about the kingdom of God. Glory, yes. I stand here tonight to, to tell you, to help you, to warn you. But it's because I'm trying to put in work for the kingdom of God. So you can have a nice walk. So your walk is not like mine. Or my, my old walk. So you don't have to uh side, right? You don't have to hit yourself a few times on the wall, right? Because I went through that. So I, I help you out. I give you my experiences. I give you the word of God. But it's for the kingdom of God that I do it. Amen. See, Esther got it a little twisted. Esther thought, oh, I'm clean now. I got to follow the rules up there. My man hasn't even called me in 30 days, so how can I go talk to him? That's my life. <laughs> and I ask you, are you willing to give up your life for 
for the kingdom. Because if you read right after this, he was like, you know what, let's do this. But let's pray and fast on it. So when you have a situation, go pray and fast on it. But she was built for this time. Just like you are getting prepared for your time. And maybe you already started walking on your purpose. Jesus. Maybe you don't even know what that is. But at the very basic thing that I can tell you is, I like basic men. I have mentored a few people and I just, yeah, let's go to the basics. Let's go to the relationship with God. At the very basic, your purpose right now is to have a relationship with God. Wow. It is for you to have a relationship with God at the very basic. This other stuff of ministry and all that stuff, that, if it's, if, if it's for you, God will show you, God will walk you through that. Now let's start with the basics. Many of us have to start with the basics, a relationship with God. Oh like I said, many times we lose our way, so we gotta remember, you know, it's, it's gotta get remembered. You know, somebody's gotta let us know and just remind us. And that's what he did. Look, listen here, man. The enemy's not gonna stop trying to stop your purpose. They just said it, and we have said it many times down here. The enemy has done things to us to try to stop that purpose. He did it as when we were a child, things that have gone in, in our lives, you know. We don't have to get into about that, but you, you understand that the enemy had tried to put a stop on you. Understand what the enemy did to Esther, because you hear she's a queen, but in reality, yo, she was she was part of like of a human trafficking. The dude just took her. The king didn't say, didn't meet her up like, oh, I like her. Let me talk to her. Let me know. He said, bring me the virgins, and they chose all these women from around the land. It wasn't her choice to go there. So she was part of human trafficking and God put her there yes. for a reason, for a purpose. See, the enemy tried to destroy her, living as a Jew, as the bottom of the bottom at that time. But God had a purpose for her. Jesus. Oh my God. Glory. The enemy is not gonna stop trying to stop you I mean, not try, it's not going to stop trying to stop your purpose. I know in my life, he tried to stop my purpose. And many times I just let him. I'm going to be honest. Oh, wow. Many times I let him because I knew better. But I chose to just keep going. I chose to keep going out, drinking, smoking. I chose that. Knowing that one day God can come. Knowing, because I had the fear of God since I was a little kid. Knowing that one day that trumpet will sound. And I will stay behind because I thought I had time. Oh, I don't have to do all these things. I got time. These people have been talking about crisis coming since the 80s. He's not come yet. I still got time to mess around, drink, and all that stuff. See, I stopped my purpose. I gotta be honest with you, because I knew. If you didn't know, that I was saying the enemy worked on it. No, but I knew, me, Nelson, I knew my purpose. I knew my purpose that I knew that I was supposed to be in a relationship with God. But I decided not to have that relationship with God. I decided to do other things, right? And that's that almost cost me my whole family. You guys know that. It would have been me just here in church. But who knows? Because I they didn't want to walk in my purpose. I chose not to follow God. I chose to just say, yes, I know God. But I still have time. Tomorrow is not promised, I tell you. I thank God for what he did and changed my life. As I was, I was, as I was speaking to this, to this lady today, it kind of reminded me because she told me, she gave me an excuse, oh, you gotta invite my husband, this, that, and the third. I said, look, you know how I speak, I'm a straight shooter. Look, stop putting all these pedals. Just start going. Yes. Because if you remember, I'm the one that first started going back to church. My wife did not follow me. So stop it with this excuse. I need a whole group, I whole entourage to come with me to church. Nah, it's you. Amen. It's a personal thing. It's you and God. 
And I'm trying to stop my purpose. Glory and I let him God. stop my purpose. And I'm sure the enemy has tried to stop David's purpose. And I'm glad Jimmy's here because Jimmy said something in the first verse that we went together. He said, David is the glue that put this thing together. Was it you, Roger? Uh, He said, David is the glue that put all this thing together because this group was, it had, it had the downtimes. It was falling apart. And David came and glued everything together. But I'm sure, and I don't, and I don't speak to David about this, but I'm sure the enemy many times has stepped into trying to stop his purpose. Even the story of him coming here, he was going somewhere else. And God told him, Whatever happens is on you. You see? But at least he's in tune with God to say, hold up. Let's not do it that way. Let's do it your way. Right? But I'm sure there's many times that the enemy has tried to stop his purpose. And I'm sure there's many times that God, that the enemy has tried to stop our pastor's purpose. Right? Anything. Everybody. It doesn't matter. He doesn't want you to go to heaven. He doesn't want you to have a relationship with God. He lost Right? And he's just trying to drag you with him. And sometimes we're just puppets and we choose to be used by him and lead other way other people astray. We're, you know, we're stumbling blocks for others. That's why you have to connect with God in such a way and understand that you do have a purpose. Understand that because now Queen Esther is a Queen Esther now. That she was just going to chill and not Y'all on your own, nah. You was made for that purpose. For that purpose. And she did. She walked. She fasted. And then she went to the king. And if you follow the beautiful story, you see all the good things that God did. The enemy thought he had an advantage on God's people. And once again, he was... <laughs> The threat of genocide to God's people ever since the garden. Understand this. From the beginning, Adam and Eve, the enemy has trying to stop the plan of God. He's trying to stop Jesus from the beginning. Because that was the promise right after Adam and Eve sinned. So he has trying to do everything that is in his power to stop the Messiah. Trying to stop God's purpose. But he cannot. And he will not. Because if it's not you, it will be someone else. Well, best believe, if I, didn't, if I didn't take the call, there will be someone else here standing today preaching to you the word of God. If Pastor Dave were not shut sure enough, there would have been another one. If Daddy were not, there would have been another Daddy. If God's thing is going to keep on moving, but he wants to move with you. Yeah. He wants to move through you. So don't get it twisted. We're just a number here. But God wants to do something great in your life. Glory. Right. I always come with these, you know, hard messages today. I'm trying to give you hope. I'm going to lift you up. I'm yes. going to lift you up. Yes. I want to tell you that you have a purpose regardless of what you think. Because some of you are thinking, bro, I'm not even worthy. I stepped last week up here thinking that I was going to change. And I went back to the same thing. But that doesn't matter because there's still time to get it right. Well, this whole month and a month and a half, we've been having such a blessing down here. Yeah. And, and week after week, people pass on. But who really made a change in their life? Who really said, look, I'm going to take this serious? Even though, even though if you said it last week, you fell short this week. It happens. And that's why I tell you, yo, you have to protect you can't kneel down. You, there's things you have to just get them out. Look, I'm, I'm actually thinking of shutting down on social media. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I lose myself, man. I'm at work. I'm bored. And I'm just, bro, I really thought about it. I'm like, yo, I got to cut it down. But then I'm like, I try to justify, right? But then I won't see the messages. I won't see, you know what I mean? I won't see the, the good stuff. I won't, oh, come on, man. Let's not play ourselves. If we put it in a percentage, the good things is one or two percent. And then the 98 is, is not God. It's not godly at all. It's, it's garbage. We know this. I'm going to have to shut it down. 
But I can't slip away because I think I'm addicted to that dopamine I'm looking because the first thing you grab is your phone. Look, if the first thing you do when you open your eyes to grab that phone, we have an issue. <laughs> Seriously. We have an issue. As soon as that, your phone blinks, I gotta, I gotta cut that blink. So somebody show me how to cut the blink off. As soon as my phone shoot. It's that serious. Some of you are twitching right now, ready to open that phone. Somebody probably just walked out right now. Like, oh, yeah. It's a real issue. And there's some things that you're going to have to remove in order for you to walk into your purpose. You're going to have to change some things. Because God is not going to move if you're not trying to move with him. Wow. If God is telling you, no, I've been telling you, I've been talking to you, and you're still doing the same thing. Yeah, you pass up from, you feel it. But it's just, that's what it is. It's just a feeling. We can't, we can't walk on feelings. You're going to have to step up and really do what you have to do. And I'm like, oh, don't, you look at me like, oh, that's the thing he has it all. No, no, listen, I don't have it all together. I'm far from perfect. I battle and struggle every day just like everyone here. But I am committed to read my Bible. I am committed to pray to God. I am committed to keep building on that relationship with the Lord every day. Even if it's just one verse a day. Yes, Ian. Thank you, Lord. We glorify your name, my God. If you ever doubted God, ever, sometimes you have doubt. My doubt is different. I don't doubt God anymore. Why? I just doubt us. I just doubt me, us, the church sometimes, because I don't see the power of God move, right, in certain situations. Scripture tells me that we will heal the sick, that we will cast out demons, that we will do these things, that we will do greater things that Jesus did when he was here. Not saying that we're better than Jesus, we're nothing, you know, closer to him, but he said we will do greater things. And God just don't see it, so that puts me in doubt, but not in doubt of God, doubt in me. What am I doing? What am I doing wrong that I can't get that? Why, yes. What are we doing as a whole in church that we don't see that? Yes. But if you have doubt of God, just God in general, if you are there sitting right now in this room and say, no, I don't think God exists. Look at the story. Look at God's people, the Jews. Look at their history. They were founded on God. And they went through all such things to try to get rid of them. You know what I mean? They try to, from the beginning, they try to destroy these people. And you see it in this book. You see what happened with the Nazis. You see all the, you know, the, what is it called? The, the Holocaust, right? You see, and they, they still standing. You can't tell me that's not God. They're in a place in the Middle East where everybody's against them. You can't tell me that's not God. I, I saw this, this, um, uh, this is a Muslim of Palestine. He's saying that they shoot rockets at them and the rockets just veer off. You can't tell me that's not God. If you doubt God, look at just the history of his people. I'm not going to take much time on this. Look, there will be a big moment in which we must choose God's purpose over our own comfort. Yes, yes. Amen. You're going to have to make a choice. Either I'm going to step into God's purpose or just stay how comfortable I am and just, you know, do my thing. It's going to be that one moment that you're going to have to make that choice. Yeah. And I tell you, chosen, I tell you, friend, if you're not really in that relationship with God, today is your day to make that commitment. Don't let it pass. Tomorrow we don't know. We can step out of here today and not make it to our homes. That's how it is. It's going to be a moment when you're going to have to make that choice. Yes. No, no matter how big or small your purpose can be, like I said, at the basics, just giving your life to Jesus. I spoke about last time that many of us might be Isaacs. Isaac doesn't have a real big story in the body. But without Isaac, there's no Jacob. That's right. Huh. Without Jacob, there's no Joseph. Without no Joseph, there's no Moses. Without Moses, there's no Joshua. Oh, Father God. Without no Joshua, there's no judges. 
there's no Samuel, there's no King Saul, and there's no King David, and we can go on and on and on until we get to the Messiah. See, Isaac's purpose was just to be a God, a, a God-fearing man that raised his family. And many of you, that might be the call. Don't overthink it. If you're into, if, if God's going to put you in a ministry, believe it. Believe it that He will show you the way. He will open the doors. He will walk you through it. Amen. But don't let that be so much weight on you. Because maybe God just called you to be a woman of God, a man of God, that someday will be a wife of God, a husband of God, that will raise beautiful kids, that maybe then will be pastors, maybe then will be teachers, or maybe you're a teacher, you're a pastor. And the beautiful thing about the gifts of the Spirit, that He gives it how He wants, so maybe God will use you to give a prophetic word. Yes. And that prophetic word can change yes. everything around someone's life. Just that one word. Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe by you choosing God and my, you know, having that relationship with God, you might change the outcome in your household. Wow. Come on, come on, yes. Wow. Maybe dad doesn't serve God. Maybe mom doesn't serve God. But you could be the difference maker in your household. Amen. Your purpose is to change your household and those around you. Their your purpose might be that that. Uh, co-worker or that fellow student, right? That just sees something different in you. Sees that you don't walk around like the world. That you don't talk like the world. And it says something about you. I like. What is it? And you have a chance to show them Jesus and talk to them about God. That might be your purpose. So, chosen. I don't know what your purpose is. But at the very basic, you should have a relationship with God. I don't know what God has in store for you. But like I said again, and I repeat it again, God will make the way for you. When I came five years ago to this church, man, I just want to ride that bench. I always say it. I want to be a bench warmer. And little by little, he has been more than me. Hey. Little by little, he's been moving me. He's been putting pieces in my life. Glory. And I thank God. I know Dave doesn't like this, but I thank God. I said it Sunday that he put this man next to me. Because iron sharpens iron. Yes. And you should be able to talk to other, you know, you and build up and, and build a relationship and, and grow together. And, you know, this should be uplifting you and changing things. But yet, a lot of you going home and going back to the same thing. <laughs> Chosen. Step into your purpose. If you don't know what that is, like I said, at the bare minimum, it's a relationship with God. There is no coincidence that you're sitting here tonight, that you're in the basement of John 3.16 in Corona, listening to this, there's no coincidence. And I am telling you right now, there is a purpose in your life. Yes, yes. And God wants to do something great in your life. God wants to do something through your life. Can we just stand? Jesus, Jesus. I hope I got the message across.